This FedGov Today program is sponsored by Hypori and Kerasoft. On this edition of FedGov Today with Francis Rose, a huge tech step forward for DIA. The ins and outs of the shifting threat landscape and intelligence integration across the IC. Welcome to FedGov Today with Francis Rose. One of the Defense Intelligence Agency's five main tech priorities for the coming year is continuing work on one of this year's main agenda items. Doug Casa is Chief Information Officer at DIA. At DOTA's 2024 recently, he says his agency's made big progress on its tech refresh. So we were operating on an architecture that was over 30 years old. Right, and as you heard from other speakers, General Henry, as an example, said that JWIX has become a part of his command and control for what he does as a J2. Um, We have pretty much finished that first phase of JWIX modernization. So we are at the tail end, over 90% completely done across JWIX of Mm -hmm. the refresh. The next phase of that, as we look into the out years, is focusing on the future architecture. And I equate operating JWIX or any network, wide area network, like traffic on a highway system, right? To where if you have more lanes and you have more on-ramps and off-ramps, it gives you more resiliency. So you're able to actually flow more information across the world. In terms of upgrading that highway system, we're done with that. The next phase of that is having the more autonomous uh, management of that network to where right now, mostly like most networks, it's a manual process. When you think about it in terms of a highway system, it's like how we would use Waze, right? Or some sort of traffic app to where as you see those networks starting to pile up or network packets starting to pile up or where you see it behaving in a way that's different, you can automatically reroute that network traffic. And that's really what we're moving towards in this next phase. And not so much just from a terrestrial perspective, which is the more traditional way of designing a network, but also from satellite capability perspective. How do we take advantage of the different ways in which we can communicate across the world, especially in denied areas? If I had to nail down one requirement that I hear across the DOD and the IC, it's how do I operate in areas that don't have a large telecom infrastructure and a footprint to be able to support communications? And that's where we're going into the next phase. It's creating a more autonomous network and it's creating a network that we can deploy anywhere basically in a box, right? To where you don't have to necessarily rely on a physical footprint of a data center in the traditional way. You could deploy that in a box and be able to operate in any environment under any conditions. That's definitely the first accomplishment that we've had is really finishing ahead of schedule what that initial refresh of JWIX needed to look like. So we're very proud of that. The other is in international systems. So we had talked a lot over the years about how do we operate not necessarily on the same network, but seamlessly with our partners. And DIA is the executive agent for 5i connectivity across the community. The traditional way of how we've uh, communicated and postured ourselves is to create independent networks. As we're looking towards zero trust and really getting at fine grade entitlements, and that's where DIA is focused. So there's seven pillars of zero trust. We're focusing on the data pillar. And it's more than just security. It's actually from a mission perspective of how can we tag the data, do those fine grained entitlements to where you don't need separate networks. The devices and the users of that network are trusted for what they're cleared to see and excluded from what they're not cleared to see. And that we've made a lot of progress in. Um, I think about how we used to do it internally within DIA. So we have integrees, which are five I integrees are essentially DIA employees. They were in a completely separate network, right? So not a shared email system, Uh, different file shares, uh, different SharePoint, everything was separate, right? You could feel the gap in how we collaborated. We created a new system called Torch, and we not only deployed it at DIA, it's one environment, right, to where they're working naturally within their own uh, ecosystem, but really divided up based on entitlements. And we've deployed that at DIA, and now we are extending that as a service throughout the community. So I think at this point, we're at every single combatant command and the J2 component. So their 5i integrees uh, and, and partners are working in the same system using the same shared infrastructure that we use at DIA. Um, as part of our storefront model, which is another service that we do on behalf of the DNI, offering uh, a, a desktop environment to those smaller agencies that don't necessarily have the expertise or the capability to really run a network, um, we've taken that, that torch model and our desktop model and have begun to deploy it um, to other agencies outside of just your traditional IC elements, but a lot of the non-Title 50. 
I think that's really been um, an area where we've had a lot of success is taking what we do uniquely, which is on wide area networks such as JWIX or secure desktop environments and providing, extending that capability to other agencies that need it. And uh, to date, we are probably over 100,000 users outside of DIA in our desktop environment. Uh, and that's been a really big success for us on part of our DOTUS modernization plan. I want to go back to the, the JWIX, the, to the next phase that you talked about at the beginning of that, uh, of the conversation, Doug. When you're building that for contested or denied environments, as you described, yeah. do you build it differently tactically or strategically than what you've done in uh, JWIX already? Yeah. Or is it just an extension of what you're doing in a more, maybe more difficult environment in which to deploy? I try in everything that we do in engineering, we really use the principle of modularity, right? So don't design unique systems for you know, environments. Have it to where you've got something that you can really deploy out of the box, tweak it to the environment you're operating in, but you have a standard architecture that you can deploy anywhere in the world under any circumstance. So the idea is not to create these disparate systems that require ex exquisite skills mm -hmm. or you know, an O&M tail that we have to support differently. You've got one architecture that operates the same way, uh, and then you can manage that as a single enterprise as opposed to having different sorts of architectures and implementation. So the idea is, is to really have a blueprint that we can deploy anywhere in the world. So we've taken the same approach uh, regardless of location or scenario. We talked a little bit before we started uh, recording that I have a unique opportunity in this conversation. Normally when I talk to folks about their strategies, it's at the beginning of the strategy yeah. and they talk about what they're going to do. Your CIO strategy at DIA runs uh, fiscal 21 to 25, so you're coming toward the close of yours. Yes. Four goals, driving customer centricity, delivering data to the point of need, optimizing the DIA CIO core, and equipping our workforce. As you're looking toward the end of that, right. how do you think you're doing and what do you still need to do to achieve the goals that you wanted to a couple of years back up? Yeah, so I would say the environment has changed over the years, so we've tried to model within the community, and this is not just DIA, this is every agency to where first it was agents, or elements within an agency, especially the mission components, they ran their own IT, right? So that was years ago. And then you had just this disparate architecture all around, right? Nothing was interoperable. And you know, like any engineering, unless it's designed to be operable, you can't just bolt it on after the fact. So then over time that moved under the CIO. And what did, what happened there was the lack of the mission understanding, right? So we understand the technology piece, but we don't necessarily understand from, from a customer's perspective the unique, oper the unique operating environments that they're in. So now we're in a model to where, where are we unique on our side as CIOs and where, do, where are the mission components unique? And so we are unique in networks, we're unique in the platforms that we can host things on, and we're unique in the data strategies. And if we really provide those foundational building blocks for everyone to come in, they can then build on top of it, right? And so they, they can be the ones that define what needs to be built. We can define, is it being built the right way? And that's where one of my priorities was the capability delivery pipeline. One front door where you can come into our environment, leverage the enterprise services that we have, whether it's networks, whether it's identity management, cross domain services, don't create your own, just adopt what we have and then build on top of it. And what that's really enabled us to do is speed up that accreditation process. Probably as a CIO, and I think any CIO would say this, the biggest complaint we have is the bureaucracy and how we do authorities to operate. Mm -hmm. Well, if you can inherit a foundational enterprise service, they don't need to worry about that. They can build on top of it, adopt it, and then they can focus on really building the unique mission capabilities within their applications or infrastructure that they're trying to deploy. And that speeds it up. Adopt as much as you can from an enterprise service. Don't recreate it. If you adopt it, it's not only interoperable, but it speeds up that whole ATO process that we hear, you know, so many get frustrated over. Less than a minute to go, Doug. Is it too early to start thinking about a 2026 to 2030 strategy or are you already on it? I'm already on it. We're actually uh, just released it. But, but for me, IT is about consistency, right? I'm not looking at, okay, what's the next big thing I'm gonna deploy? If you look over time, if you look over history uh, in IT, they're, they're evolutions. Right, so they're small evolutions from what exists. So that's where, that's where we're going. And the strategy really continues to focus in the priorities that I have, mainly JWIX, international partnerships, that capability delivery pipeline, and then the desktop modernization, which I include Zero Trust as part of that. The next iteration is really getting into the data pillar and how does that, of Zero Trust, and how that goes across those four areas. 
that's my focus. In terms of workforce, we're continuing in the 508 realm, so supporting those with disabilities is going to remain a big priority of mine. We started a couple of years ago our neurodiverse hiring program. That's been a success. Um, I think a lot of agencies have leveraged lessons learned from DIA, and I've done the same across the community. So workforce is definitely going to be a, a continued emphasis for ours, especially upskilling. Um, part of my workforce, a uh, large contingent of military, uh, in addition to civilian, we have uh, about 4,000 employees. To really be successful in IT, you can't just focus on only one domain, one discipline within technology. To really integrate designs and make things interoperable, you got to understand a little bit of everything. And so I've, I've made a big investment on, in online learning um, and really creating a platform to where folks can get certifications, they can uh, get STEM degrees, we even offer master's degrees in systems engineering. So that's a continued focus of ours is on the workforce side. You can read more at fedgovtoday.com. Up next, the ins and outs of the shifting threat landscape. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. Civilian federal service follows countless paths, each road unique, each journey distinct. WEPA has covered them all since 1943, from the demands of the job and accomplishments at work to the joys of the family and milestones at home, from inside the office to beyond the beltway. Group term life insurance from WEPA has the coverage and benefits to protect you and your loved ones wherever Fed Life leads. WEPA, for Feds, by Feds. Welcome back. One of the problems for cyber and intel leaders in government to deal with is how fast the threat landscape shifts. Players who weren't involved at all or weren't threats in the recent past are major threats now. Jared Shepard is president and CEO of Hypori. At Dota's 2024 recently, he says the threat landscape is changing really quickly. You know, things that are going on in the Middle East, you know, are, are kind of growing out of scale, you know, at, at scale that we didn't anticipate. Uh, I think that causes some level of desperation from some certain actors, which, which that can present problems and threat and all on its own. Um, we still have, you know, the, the largest threat, which is, you know, China, uh, who is is never dormant, right? You know, that they actually, I think, prefer when there's other conflicts that are happening because they can kind of operate quietly in the background. Uh, uh, and then, of course, you know, Russia, Russia, Ukraine, um, that's a problem set, you know, I think uh, that the Russian leadership would love to uh, distract from their battle and, and get people to look in other directions. And, and often that can happen in a, from a technical standpoint. Um, from a, a, a technical threat landscape, you know, it's, I don't want to say it's, it's, it's the same old thing, but um, in some ways it's the same, in some ways it's new. So like, you know, our, our generation's uh, version of splitting the atom, right? You know, like, you know, the, the, the previous version when they split the atom is like, okay, it could, this could solve world energy or end the world. Yeah. Our, our version of that is AI, right? And so in our, what we're seeing now is this emergence of AI and, and it, does AI present a threat or is it helpful? And the answer is yes, um, you know, just much, much like the atom. Um, the, how it's going to be used by, by, by actors, by threat actors is, is still yet to be seen. I think it's going to give uh, uh, aggressive platforms, you know, very well-developed nation state actors like the Chinese, et cetera, it's gonna give them even better of an edge. Um, the, the interesting turn is gonna be though, it also gives people who don't have a lot of skill, skill. Mm -hmm. So I think it's gonna actually make uh, the, the, the threat uh, environment more dense um, with more rudimentary or, or you know more traditional types of threats but coming from more directions so the attack surface is is hugely critical right now right and and I mean that's obviously one of the things that we focus on is trying to reduce that attack surface I think that's uh, a lot of this conference I think a lot of the conversations about that are about okay how do we how do we uh, reduce attack surface how do we diversify threat you know so that we can actually uh, minimize loss of data, loss of capability, loss of visibility, maintaining information dominance on a battlefield is always difficult, right? You know, how can we use those technologies to do that? It sounds like you're proposing uh, a democratization almost of threat capability because of artificial intelligence. Does that mean potentially that there is a democratization of the defense responses as well? AI is definitely gonna play in defense just as like it plays in offense, right? And, and we're gonna have to get smarter uh, you know, like one of the, the, the big things that they have to, that I think you're gonna be able to leverage AI for even now is gonna be like insider threat, you know, so being able to see patterns, behaviors, uh, people doing things that they shouldn't be doing, accessing things they shouldn't be accessing, right? It's gonna change that landscape a lot. Um, I think possession of the data, you know, data is 
is our currency, right? I mean, anymore, it's actually probably more valuable than currency. Um, information, right? And maintaining information dominance. So uh, when you talk about democratizing the, the threat and defending the mechanism, I think it's also about how do you uh, actively control information, um, ensure that it's not being tainted. Like, you know, one of the big threats with AI is AI poisoning. Mm -hmm. um, how do you ensure, like, if you look at the external influence now with social media, if AI is being used to, to, to you know, use social media as an attack platform, influence outcomes, it doesn't have to be a direct offense. It can be an influence campaign, right? And so it, it makes the intelligence community's job really hard uh, on how they can try to stay ahead of the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And that gets to the topic of uh, maintaining that edge, the, the technological edge over a potential adversary. Sure. When we don't know which adversary may be the potential threat actor in a situation, What's the implication there for how one thinks about what the response and, and what the potential defense is going to be? Well, I mean, you know, the, the, there's the old, old military saying we say, say is, you know, no, no good plan survives first contact. That's right. Um, the, I think the answer is it's all of them. Mm. Like, so, so there isn't going to be any, which adversary, it's going to be all of them. And it's going to be for different reasons, for different motivations and, and with different desired outcomes. Uh, how do we stop that? Or how do we get our desired outcome is probably more, more realistic. Cause I don't think we're gonna be able to stop it. We have to uh, have our priorities straight. We have to invest uh, both from a government standpoint, but also in an industry standpoint. Um, industry has to participate. You know, we're seeing now uh, uh, CMMC just came out, you know, and, and the CMMC guidance came out and I, I've, I've heard some people celebrate it and I've heard some people kind of go, oh God, why? You know, it's gonna be so expensive to do and this is BS, this is government overreach or whatever. And, and it's really not, right? If you look at it like the, the Chinese have a, a joint strike fighter that looks a lot like ours. Why is that? It wasn't a DOD network that got hacked. It was a contractor's network that got hacked, right? And, and they stole the plans. That's the way our adversaries are going to continue to, to uh, optimize and come up fast is they're gonna steal a lot of information. And the next generation of AI isn't gonna be invented by one of these massive companies because most of these massive companies buy technology. They don't invent it. It's going to be invented by a 10 person company that's maybe here at the show or somewhere else that's you know, approaching something new. And if they're not actively defending that IP, that idea, the thought, the implementation, then it's vulnerable. So it's, it's a hard challenge that uh, is going to take all of us. You can read more at FedGovToday.com. Up next, intelligence integration across the IC. FedGov Today with Francis Rose continues in a moment. The new TV show, Better Contracting, Better Outcomes, is available on demand now at fedgovtoday.com. You'll learn from top executives at NASA, DOD, Social Security, and more, plus industry experts that are leading government industry partnerships. Discover their strategies for improving acquisition efficiency, achieving mission success, and driving innovation through federal contracting. Better Contracting, Better Outcomes, presented by the National Contract Management Association. Watch anytime at fedgovtoday.com. Welcome back. Leaders from seven commands across the military discuss the concept of intelligence integration at DOTUS 2024. Brigadier General Melissa Stone, Director of Intelligence J2 at U.S. Cyber Command, was one of them. After that panel discussion, she tells me intelligence integration isn't just a mode of operation. It's a way of life at Cyber Command and frankly at all of the, the, the combatant command J2s. So integrating intelligence into operations, informing all of our components and our operators what the threat landscape looks like, and then integrating that into their plans. Um, that's true for us at Cyber Command, where we have a mission to work with every combatant command, integrating uh, military options in cyberspace into all of their plans as well. So that intelligence integration really is day-to-day -day fundamental to what we do interacting with our operators. Mm -hmm. How is that landscape changing over time? It's a great question. I think from a cyber perspective, uh, it's clear that every one of our adversaries has prioritized cyber uh, as a uh, as a warfighting domain. Uh, and because of that, the landscape of threat actors has just increased. Uh, not just nation state actors, but nation sponsored actors, hacktivists, cyber criminals. The barrier to entry into the domain is relatively low. Uh, and so it's just really increased the scope and the breadth of adversaries that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you encourage organizations within the defense community to think about those different types of threat actors differently because of their composition, their sponsorship, their posture, their capabilities, anything else? 
I think it's just important to really have an understanding of what they're up to and, and for what purpose. So uh, we maintain what I would call analytic overmatch, thankfully, uh, against all of our adversaries. And that's vital uh, in terms of how we approach the risks that we are taking in the command, how we deal with them. So we will look at uh, adversary capability, techniques and procedures and tactics uh, and how we determine what we're going to do about those adversaries. Mm -hmm. As you look across that landscape, is there one area, uh, one type of threat actor where you see activity or capability accelerating faster than the others? The PRC is our pacing threat uh, in cyberspace. Uh, they maintain the largest cyberspace operations force and enablers uh, in the world. Uh, so scale and scope for us is a challenge there, but thankfully uh, we have a, a very strong cadre of experienced uh, experts that work in this space. Um, so that's our advantage, that and partnerships, frankly. Um, where we can partner with industry, with academia, with our national security agency, our most important partners, and also our international partners, really gives us a unique advantage there. What are the, the hallmarks of a good international partnership? What, are, what exchange goes on among those? I imagine it's not just data and information. Sure, you're right. It's not just data and information, although those are two very important things. I think at the, at the foundation of a partnership is a really good level of trust. We, we maintain trust for, with partners that have strong cybersecurity. They can protect the information that we'd like to share with them. So partners that can do that, uh, we can share more, they can share more with us, and we can really work together in a much more effective way. I had a conversation a number of years ago with a, a general who at the time was the commander of Africa Command, General Carter Ham, and he uh, was talking about PRC activity in that, on that continent. He said, we want to be the partner of choice. At the time, the Belt and Road Initiative was really, uh, was really prominent. Um, is that still what you find to be the most effective way to build these partnerships, is to demonstrate to them that the United States is, will give better outcomes uh, than other choices? Certainly helpful. I think in the United States, especially with our industry partners, you're going to find trustworthy partners. Uh, you're not going to find that necessarily if you choose to partner with China and Russia. And I think there's been multiple examples where we've seen that trust not exactly play out. Um, for us, as we look at uh, Chinese activity and Russian activity throughout the globe, absolutely, uh, we want to help understand, we want to help those countries understand the threats that they are bringing into their networks when they partner with those adversaries. So that is part of the intelligence and information sharing part of our partnership strategy. I wish I had a nickel for every booth at this show that had something in it about referencing artificial intelligence. Me too. What are some of the tools in AI or not that you're finding that are helping you to do the things that you talked about at the beginning of this conversation that are important to defending against those threat actors? I, th I think artificial intelligence is, uh, I think you said it well, it's become kind of a buzzword. It's a very popular term. Uh, but we would be remiss if we didn't maximize what we're able to get from new technology uh, such as AI and machine learning. And I think the way the command has approached that is we've established an AI roadmap, um, which has now uh, been published. And so that articulates how we are looking at different technologies. I won't get into specifics, but how we're looking at different technologies and operationalizing them and then kind of picking best of breed for what we want to roll with in the future. Understanding that you can't be too specific, how do you evaluate new technologies of all types to determine if there is an applicable use case, uh, an actual application, and avoid that idea of, oh, this is new, so we should try it? Great question. I think there's several parts of that. One is, I think, foundationally, I mentioned the cybersecurity at the very beginning. Uh, we can't adopt technology that's going to provide the, the adversary with a soft underbelly to attack. So that cybersecurity uh, the trust, the data protocols that need to be really transparent for us. Uh, and then something that has been uh, rapidly prototyped, developed and tested, that gives us that kind of confidence in the tools that we're bringing on board with the, within the command. You've mentioned relationships with industry a number of times in this conversation already, General. Uh, what makes for a good partnership in that respect? Trust, I'm sure, is number one. And then there are other elements that are important in building that relationship with industry and in the communications that you have with vendors at a and an event like this. For sure, I think that trust is, is paramount. And we've talked through um, what makes a good partner a, a few times, and uh, certainly there are several. I think one, you know, we, we rely on our industry partners, the scope and scale of operations in cyberspace, the pace of which technology changes. Uh, we need to be humble in the department to understand we may not always be the experts, we may not always have the right solution. So opening the door to partners in industry has been very uh, impactful for us. We expect a lot from those partners in terms of cybersecurity. We also expect a trust relationship uh, where we understand 
uh, the data flows, where it's going, uh, and, and where we might be accepting some risks. So I think just that trust, that communication, the cybersecurity aspect of the tool, uh, but we absolutely rely on our industry partners and are thankful for them. Mm -hmm. um, you said we expect a lot from our industry partners, and you listed a couple of those things. What should they expect from you? What, what do you encourage them to expect from you in exchange for what you want them to deliver for you? I, I think it's fair for our industry partners that work with the command to expect clear requirements from us uh, and, and operability standards. And so those are two main things that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. As you uh, come to a show like this, how do you determine that was a successful time, that the time that I spent there was invested well? What results do you take back? What outcomes do you get to know that you accomplished what you wanted to accomplish when you visit something like this? It's very helpful uh, to hear that question. I think I'll, I'll think about that from an intelligence standpoint a little bit more, but um, in terms of how I look at these engagements, one is an ability to network with, uh, with folks um, that, I, that I don't get to see very often. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's always very helpful to get to hear the leaders uh, that we heard from speak today, whether that was General Henry and General Cotton, uh, the members of Congress that we got to hear from today. It's always helpful to hear those perspectives. In terms of an engagement like this, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the recruiting goals that Cyber Command is working on. So uh, the command is actively recruiting. And I, I can think of no better place today if you're interested in cyber, where you would want to work if you want to actually contribute to operations day to day. There's no other place where we are in contact with an adversary on a daily basis other than Cyber Command and our components. So, so I think one metric that I would take is, uh, are we able to get the message out a little bit more about Cyber Command and encourage folks to apply? They can do that through Cyber Command directly on our website. If they're interested in the intelligence part, we're staffed through the Defense Intelligence Agency and very thankful for that partnership. But we have components from every military service presented to Cyber Command, all of which are looking for folks that can think critically and that are ready to get after it. You kind of went where I wanted to go as we start to close General Stone, and that is what's the talent that you're looking for? What makes somebody a good cyber operations person? I think there's several things, um, and I mentioned a few times, I think we are hiring, uh, but uh, someone that can think critically, that can bring a new way of thinking to difficult problems, and someone that's not afraid of a little bit of work. Uh, this is a very busy domain, uh, but it's a, it's a very rewarding place to be. Uh, if you're willing to come in and learn uh, and then, you know, you know, work for the good of the nation here as we have, you know, no shortage of adversaries trying to do us harm. I just want to confirm one more time you're hiring. We are general. hiring, yes, sir. You can read more on today's show page at FedGovToday.com. FedGov Today continues in a moment. The new TV show, Better Contracting, Better Outcomes, is available on demand now at FedGovToday.com. You'll learn from top executives at NASA, DOD, Social Security, and more, plus industry experts that are leading government industry partnerships. Discover their strategies for improving acquisition efficiency, achieving mission success, and driving innovation through federal contracting. Better Contracting, Better Outcomes, presented by the National Contract Management Association. Watch anytime at FedGovToday.com. FedGov Today TV returns next Sunday morning at 10.30. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great week.